lecture on networking and HTTP. Um, this lecture has the intention to cover the basics that are needed to understand how well the internet works and how requests travel in, in the World Wide Web. Um, and that knowledge is at least on a basic level necessary to uh, really understand what we're doing in web development. It is quite abstract, so you'll get much more in-depth knowledge when you take the networking course, but this is sort of the, the essential thing you need to understand what's going on. Um, what we'll cover are networking basics, um, so what are hosts, what are IP addresses, requests and responses in the web, and a little bit on the TCP IP protocol. Um, and then in the second part of this lecture, I'll cover the HTTP protocol, which is the protocol that really runs the World Wide Web um, that you are using every day. The learning outcomes are three that are official and then sort of a couple of unofficial ones. Uh, so you should be able to summarize what HTTP requests and responses contain, what they do. Uh, you should be able to list different methods and their purpose and finally explain the features of different HTTP methods and we'll get back to that. Now uh, in the official syllabus there are no learning outcomes on the networking so these are sort of unofficial that you should be able to distinguish what the difference is between the internet and the World Wide Web, uh, explain IP address structures and summarize TCP IP. Um, these are not really course learning outcomes but as I said they are somewhat necessary to understand what's going on. Now the book uh, we're using in this course does not cover much on the basics of networking on HTTP so there is not a dedicated chapter there. Uh, there are some smaller explanations on client server on HTTP response codes and on the HTTP methods in chapter 6 in the server chapter uh, but these are very brief and uh, they are needed in the in the server side part, uh, which we'll get back much later in this course. So uh, you don't really need to read in the book for this course. And then there are a number of resources, which uh, they are all not exam relevant, but uh, they are the the official documentation for the different things. So uh, the RFC 122 or 1122 is the technical description of all the different layers of the TCP/IP. So it's really a description of how the internet works really. Uh, HTTP on, on developer Mozilla gives you a good overview of HTTP so it's just a, a basic overview but much more digestible than, than the standards um, and then 7.230 uh, and 7.231 are the official standards for HTTP if you want to look into that. Uh, and then again there is httpstatus.com, which gives you a brief description of the HTTP response code. So that's something we'll go into later. Now, as we discussed in the first lecture, uh, the World Wide Web was invented by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989. It was public from 91. Um, and we said it contains hypertext, hypermedia, all of these things. But then, of course, the question really is, what's the difference between what I wrote here, the World Wide Web, and the internet because nowadays we really uh, discuss those interchangeably we use those however they fit uh, but they are really different concepts so if you listen to the inventor himself then the internet is a network of networks so this is really all about the hardware it's computers like your laptop your mobile phone cables back in the days nowadays it could be wireless but it's all about how are things connected physically uh, and how do I get information from one computer to the next. It's sort of the architecture underlying uh, everything. The web then, the World Wide Web, is the information space. So it's sort of all the documents, all the pictures, all the videos that you can access somehow. Um, and that's really the difference. So on the net you find computers, that's the hardware. On the web you find well, documents, websites, and so on. Uh, so it's two different things. And the first part that we talk about is the internet. Uh, so a contraction of interconnected networks uh, is really the global system of connecting computers that you can access a picture that is lying on the other side of the world on a computer in San Francisco or in South America or so on. 
Uh, and this all started with the so-called ARPANET, so that's the predecessor of the internet, which was originally a defense and military thing. So all of this was originally fen funded by the DOD in the US, um, and the intention was academic and military. So it was really all about exchanging academic information, for example, data from experiments or military information. Um, and already then, something will go back into in much more depth. Uh, back then already we used TCP IP, so this is a combination of protocols to basically make sure that your information travels from one computer to the next. Uh, and this one is, is a nice little map of the ARPA network, so that's in 73. This is a map of essentially the internet. So what you see here, the round circles are computers. Um, so you see there's one in Hawaii, there's one in Stanford, there's one in uh, University of California in, in Los Angeles. Um, and then these are sort of the, the internet, uh, the, the networking stations in a way, the, the cable shacks where everything would be connected. Uh, so this is really a logical map of how the internet looked like. And as you've seen, it's, it's pretty small. It's just a bit of the US and nowadays good luck trying to, to draw a, uh, a map of the internet. But that's the background. So it has evolved from a military academic thing to really a worldwide free open infrastructure. Uh, interesting is of course that nowadays we have a lot of countries, Iceland being number two here, where almost everybody is connected. Um, the reason I show this map or this figure is really to give you a, uh, an impression of how this is in other places. Because if you look at 2017, um, then you see that we are in Europe, we are at 80%. So you already see the, the, F, the internet use on average is much, much lower in Europe than of course in Iceland, only 80%. Um, if you go to Africa, you're at 21%. So there are interesting things here in the sense that whenever you design your applications, you should consider this, that there are 20% in Europe, there are almost 80% in Africa that don't have access to it. Uh, and that of course gives rather big implications. And that's really the, the societal dimension of, of uh, web development, that it's something that's not accessible to everyone yet. Uh, in Africa, most likely the number has increased dramatically because an interesting thing, if you look at it, is the development here uh, that you have a tenfold increase over 12 years. Uh, so it's quite a dramatic increase compared to other things. Uh, for example, Europe has gone from 46 to 79, so it's not even double. Uh, so this is also where you can expect a lot of development in, in the coming years. But this page, this slide is really the message. Keep this in mind when you develop your applications. Who has access to it? Now, the internet we discussed is a connection of computers. And the question is, how does it work? Uh, and what it really runs on is a protocol stack, a number of protocols that are called TCP IP. Uh, and their purpose is to address and route data. Now that means, well, you have to have an address to send something over the internet, you have to know where it's going. Uh, you have to know how you route it, how you direct it to the right place. Um, and in many cases, like when you watch a video, this video, for instance, you have to segment it. You cannot send the, one, the, the whole thing in one piece, but you have to break it down into smaller packets. Um, and that includes a lot of uh, work because you somehow have to make sure that you get those packets together again. You have to make sure that all of them arrive and so on. Uh, then whenever you write your applications, you somehow have to use this. So it should be simple. Not everyone that creates a website, for example, can know all the details of TCP IP. Um, and we have lots of errors in the internet, so it has to be reliable. For example, uh, the most common thing nowadays is we have Wi-Fi uh, and a connection over wireless is always error prone. So it's easy to lose information. You have to make sure that everything arrives. If something gets lost, you send it again and so on. Uh, and finally, you have a structure of the internet. So not everything is in the same uh, 
address space, but you somehow segment the whole thing that you have sub networks. For example, the university here has a sub network just for the university and then you have everything outside. Uh, a good thing about the internet is that all the standards are open. So there is a task force called the IETF um, that discusses how to evolve the protocols, how to change them. Uh, and they are published in so-called requests for comments. These are the RFCs. Um, and that's where you can see all the standards. So many other standards are, uh, are not open. For example, many of the ISO standards you might have heard of, you have to pay to, to get but the uh, IETF standards are all openly accessible. And maybe that's a good time to actually look at one of them, uh, just to see what I mean. So you can just go to this website uh, and you'll see that you have the requirements for internet hosts, communication layers. So this is the specification for essentially how the internet works. Um, and the RFCs are always in this kind of format, so they're, they're, they look like it's an old fashioned type document, but it's really all you need. Uh, so it tells you how is the internet structured, what are hosts, and so on. And then it links to all relevant things. Um, so that's good. It's not very good to study because those things are long. As you see, the, this standard alone has 112 pages. Um, but of course, if you want to write an application that works, in for all of the internet, you have to know the details. Or if you were, if you write something for the IP protocol, you have to make sure that you cover all the cases. So that's really when you want to look into there because you get all the details. Uh, for example, how is a, a machine addressed? What's the address and so on. So those are the, the RFCs. Um, we might use them now and then. But now we get to the question, how do we actually uh, do requests in the internet? Because what I can do, what all of you do many times per day is request information from the internet. Uh, and a typical thing I might be doing is I, I'm on my computer, I open my browser and I say, go to Google. I want to Google something and I press enter and you all know what happens. Ideally, I get the Google front page. Uh, and the question is now what happens in the background? What happens in the background is that my request is going through a number of machines uh, all over the place. And at some point they arrive at Google. Uh, and these machines are at different places. For example, here you see ru.is. So that's most likely that's a computer that is standing in the university. Uh, here, here you have something that's called Neutholzweig, so that's probably a, an Icelandic thing. And again, it's .is, so it's still in Iceland. Um, Technigader, so it's same thing, a, a computer in the internet. I probably forgot the S here, but it's most likely it's IS. Uh, then there can be many other computers in between, and at some point I have something that is really hard to read, .net. This is, as far as I remember, is already a Google computer, and then I'm at Google. So somehow, my request from my machine in Iceland travels through a number of computers, through a number of cables or Wi-Fi to the target host, to the target computer. Um, and that one then, of course, sends the information back. Now we can look at this. Um, so in the command line, you can look at a request by using the trace route command. In Windows, it's trace RT, I think. Um, but I could say trace route Google. So I want to know how is the route from my computer to Google. Um, and when I press enter, it does the whole process. So you see that uh, it says, okay, the first step is going to this machine here. The second one is going to this. And here is something at Ringbreit, so it's all somewhere in Iceland.is. And then here Nordu.net is maybe already some computer that is not in Iceland. Uh, it says Ray, so maybe that's Reykjavik. Um, but then UK is probably a machine in the UK. So you see that somehow this request travels through different computers. Um, and that's really what I've depicted here in the picture. Now, um, 
What this is really doing is that I send a request to google.com, I press enter on my browser, the request is routed, so it's somehow directed um, via a number of servers, a number of computers that are in the middle, they're intermediate. Uh, and then the response from Google comes back to me. Uh, an important thing is that routes can differ over time. So if I do the same request again tomorrow, it might go a different way. And also the response from Google can go a different way. So it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So which route I'm taking doesn't really matter as long as it arrives. And the same goes for the uh, response. And how all of this works, so how my computer knows that I have to go here and, and so on, this is handled by TCP IP, by the protocol stack. Um, and that one also handles, for example, if something gets lost along the way that I'm sending it again. Um, how does this handle is actually quite complicated and this is part of the networking course, so we just do a, a small excursion here. But what you typically have are two so-called hosts. So a host is basically a computer that has information. Uh, and in my case, host A would be my computer. I want to get to Google and host B is the target. That's google.com. Uh, and in between there are so-called routers. So there are machines that direct my request. Uh, and the data then flows in a pretty complicated way. So you are in your application. I am in Firefox, for example, and I type google.com. Uh, and this request is then broken down to different layers um, and sent over the internet. And then it's sent to a target application. So in, in this case, it goes back to my browser. Uh, but there are a lot of things happening in between. And this is something that can be uh, discussed in much, much detail. So what I'm doing really here is an, is an application, a request, in this case, an HTTP request in my browser. I type an address. Um, then this request gets broken down to the so-called transport layer. Uh, and the role of that layer is really to do the addressing. So it, it makes sure that there is a connection between the two computers. Uh, it makes sure that my packets get sent in the right way and it makes sure that everything arrives. That's the role. Then we can go down a layer further. Uh, we are on the internet layer and that's the addressing, the routing. So it's really addressing individual machines. Which address does my computer have? Which address does the computer uh, here at the university have? Which address does the, you know, uh, the Google computer have? Um, and how do I take this way? And finally, we have the so-called link layer, the lowest level, that's all about the hardware. So as you know, you can have a Wi-Fi connection, you could have a Bluetooth connection, you could have an Ethernet, a cable connection, you could have a fiber or satellite connection. So there are lots of different hardwares in place. Uh, and the link layer has the role of handling these things so that it doesn't matter whether your computer is connected with a cable or with a Wi-Fi or with a fiber. Uh, so that's the link layer and we won't be talking much about this layer. Um, again, that's something for the networking course. So we start on the internet layer addressing and routing um, and that's what the IP protocol is all about. Now, what you see here is exactly the same I've shown you before. The only thing is I've replaced the names of the servers with these numbers. Um, and if we go back to my console window, you see the same here. So here you have the, the name and in brackets you have an address. And this is the so-called IP address. Um, they usually look like this. So they have four blocks separated by a dot. Um, and the role is really to identify machines. So you have this number, you have this address to identify a machine uniquely. Uh, and the host name, so the real, the name I've shown you before is really just something that is used for, for human understanding. Uh, so if it says google.com, that's because it's much easier for me to remember google.com compared to this address here. So host names are just for, for human understanding, um, but in practice in the machine they are translated into an IP address. <coughs> this is done using DNS, that's not so important here, just so hey, you have seen it. Um, so for example, google.com has the IP address 
to 1110. Uh, and what you can see is uh, you can use these as well. So if you out of some reason, uh, if you prefer to remember this number instead of google.com, you could also go to Firefox and just type in this number uh, and it will also bring you to Google. And as you see, the, the browser has replaced it automatically. Uh, so it's really interchangeable. It's just that we are much better at remembering names than these kind of numbers. Um, there are two different formats. We just look at IP version four here, um, but IP version four is four blocks of eight bit numbers. So numbers between zero and 255 and they're separated by a dot. Uh, so that's an, uh, an address. Um, and if you do a bit of combinatorics on this, you get uh, that you can have 4 billion possible addresses. So that's all you can have in the internet. Some of them are reserved. For example, you will see a lot in this course, the address 127.0.0.1. This is always the address that points to your own local machine. Uh, so whenever you enter this, you try to access your own machine. Um, now, 4 billion sounds like a lot, but this is actually a problem because with the whole IoT uh, development, Internet of Things, we are planning to have about 50 billion devices connected to the Internet in, I think it's 2020 or so, so already now, or at least in the near future. So these addresses are not enough. We need more. Uh, and that's why a couple of years ago they, they released IPv6 version 6. Um, that has an extended address space. So it supports much, much more addresses enough to, I think enough to address every atom in the universe or something like that. So it's a pretty crazy number, but it's, it's basically to ensure that in the future we'll be able to grow the internet without running into problems because every machine has to have a unique address. Otherwise we cannot connect to it. Now, the interesting question is, if I have the address, so I know that this is, for example, Google, how does my computer or how does a router know where to send my packet, where to send the request? Um, and the answer to that is something that's called a net mask. So that's an additional number that is required to, uh, to identify whether the current IP address is in the same network or not. Um, and what you see here, you have the address 216.58.211.110 slash 24. And this slash 24 is the network mask. And it basically says the first 24 bits in this address are the network. So they identify the network. And then within that network, the remaining bits, in this case, we have just eight bits left, identify the machine. Uh, and this way a computer can calculate, okay, if I know 24, I can say that 216.58.211.0, that's the network. So this is sort of a sub-network of the internet. Uh, and in this network, I want to get to machine 110. Uh, and now the router can basically say that if my network address is different from the request, then I'm in the wrong network, I have to send it outside, I have to send it to the internet. Um, and that's exactly how routing works on a very basic level. So a router always knows the own network and it knows some other routers somewhere in the internet. Uh, and whenever it gets a request, it basically checks, is it in the same network? And if it's not, it sends it out, it sends it to the next router. If it is in the internet, then it has a list of all the computers that are within the same internet, uh, within the same network. So on a very uh, basic level, that's how routing works. You check, am I in the same network? Yes or no. Then uh, just to mention this, there are some IP network numbers, some IP ranges that are reserved for private networks. Uh, and I mainly mention them because you might have seen them. So for example, if you have a router at home for your, for your internet, uh, very common IP addresses are 192, 168, uh, So that's, a, that's the typical network that you have at home. Uh, and then there are two more that are used usually for, for larger uh, private networks. So for example, here in the university, 
you see that we're using this 10 dot and then the remainder is the machine name. Uh, so those are private networks. Um, and if you see those, you always know that they are within sort of the, within the organization at home and so on. So if you check your IP address at home, you'll see that most likely it's something like that, 192, 168.0. Okay, so um, what we've discussed so far is that I want to send the request from my computer to Google uh, and we have a bit of terminology here. So the first thing is my computer and the target is usually called the host name. So that's something you should be knowing. Uh, I mentioned it already. So those are the machines uh, where the request comes from, where the response comes from. Then you have a so-called IP address. So that's just the host name translated to a number. That's the real address that the computer uses. And you have a lot of servers that are in between when you send the request. So it's routed via those intermediate servers. Uh, and these routes are basically the connections between the computers. And as we discussed, they can change over time. So maybe the next time you send this request, the response goes directly over here or so. Uh, intermediate servers can have a lot of different roles. Um, so they can be routers, as we already discussed. So computers that basically direct the traffic in a certain direction that make sure your, your packet, your request reaches the target. Uh, they can be proxies, maybe you have heard that. So those are machines that, for example, filter data, make sure that you're authenticated, that encapsulates or they hide part of a network. Um, they cache, that's a very important concept. So they basically try to reuse data so you don't have to send the same request all over again. So those are typical things. For example, um, a typical thing you have in companies what proxies do is they might disallow certain uh, connections. So for example, the company does not want you to be on Facebook all day, so they block it. That would be the role of a proxy to say, whenever you send a request to Facebook, we instead redirect you to Google or we send you to a page that says not allowed or something like that. Uh, there are computers that are called firewalls that are uh, essentially security things. So they make sure that there are no attacks or uh, that if you if you get a response from a malicious place, it's blocked or so on. Uh, there are machines that are load balancers, as the name suggests. They they try to balance the load over multiple computers. Uh, so Google again is a good example. They have lots and lots of computers that answer your search requests. Uh, and at some point there is a load balancer that says, okay, if the first computer has too much work to do, send it to another one. And then finally, one important thing is whenever you see the, in this picture, I'm using the, the picture for a machine, for a computer, uh, for a server. But an important thing to understand is that on one computer, on one physical machine, uh, there can be several server processes. So basically several applications running uh, that fulfill a certain purpose. So the server is usually used as a name both for the physical machine, but also for the software running. For example, on my computer, I can have a mail server and at the same time I can have a, a web server. Uh, that's no problem. Good. Now, this was all about machines, computers. Uh, now we'll make a, a very similar example in the real life, uh, in the non-computer life. And that's about post. So. I do something very similar when I want to send post around and answer to it. So imagine I'm sitting here at uh, Reykjavik University and I want to order uh, a new computer. And I want to order it from Apple in, in the US. Um, what do I do? Well, typically I go to their website, but I could actually also send them an old fashioned, I could send them a letter. So let's say that's what I'm doing. Um, and what I'll do is I'll send the letter to the internal post here. So there's some kind of post system that makes sure that my letter gets sent. Uh, the internal post looks at it and says, okay, this goes to US. It's not within our own uh, company. It's not within the university. So we have to send it outside. Uh, the mail truck picks it up. It brings it probably to some central post in Reykjavik. Um, 
they realize it's not within Iceland, so we have to send it via ship somewhere else. Uh, it probably arrives somewhere in the US or I don't know where. Uh, and at some point it arrives in, in the US and it's sent via a truck to Cupertino uh, and it's sent to Apple directly. So that's typically how my letter could, could arrive. Uh, and you directly see that routes can change. So it could also happen that my letter gets sent by post, uh, by airmail instead. So then the route here is different. Uh, and most likely also the point where it arrives is different. So routes can change over time. Um, and the response then, Apple takes the parcel, sends it back to me. And again, maybe the parcel is transported a different way because it should go much quicker. It's going by airplane instead of ship. Um, so this is really exactly the same thing. Uh, what I have down here is similar to my host name. I have an address that identifies me uniquely, hopefully. Uh, I have these intermediates. So here they're basically post offices all over the world that process my, my email or my mail, sorry. Um, you have routes, different ways that your, your parcel, your letter can take. Um, and it's really exactly the same. So intermediate servers can have different functions. You could have a post office where you sort. Uh, you could have internal post, for example, uh, which is similar to a proxy. So here at Reykjavik University, they sort out email uh, that goes to different places compared to, email, uh, to mail that stays within the university. Um, you encapsulate. So if someone sends to Reykjavik University to my address here, uh, you see that there is not my office number there. So they don't know where exactly I'm sitting. Uh, so the internal post actually has to do this sorting. So there's some kind of encapsulation going on. And similar to a proxy, they might filter stuff. So if I, let's say, I want to get a Playboy subscription at work, uh, my boss might show up and say, well, you know, that's not the right place to do that. So it's a similar way to a proxy for internet that they say, don't go to Facebook while you're here. Um, and we discussed routes can differ. So most likely the parcel is taking a different route compared to a letter. Um, and there's a different speed if I'm using a ship or a truck or an airplane. So it's really pretty much the same uh, whether you're using the internet or the post. So the mechanism is quite similar. IP addresses a net mask. Well, uh, the analogy here is really street name, zip code, city name. Uh, if you write a street name only, then you have no idea where to go because street names are really common in many places. So you, it's not like your street is unique. Um, so it's not enough to just have the street name. You also have to check the city, the zip code, maybe even the country. Um, and that's the way to distinguish whether you are in, whether you have to deliver your, your mail in the same city or you have to send it somewhere else. So that's quite comparable to the IP address and to the net mask that you need two elements to really figure out where to send it. Okay, so that was the, the internet layer, basically the IP protocol. And now we'll dive shortly into the transport layer, uh, which as we discussed is about end to end connections. So make sure that uh, connections are established, are cancelled, are the right order of packages is there and they are reliable. And this is the role of the TCP, the transmission control protocol. Um, so what TCP does is it makes sure there is a connection while you are sending something. It makes sure that your request is cut into chunks. So if you send a video is put into a lot of small packets and sent away. Uh, it makes sure that, talking about videos, for example, that there is an order. So we discussed that routes can take different times. So it might be that your video information at minute two arrives before the video information at minute one. Uh, so TCP then makes sure that these things are reordered so that you can actually watch the video. Um, TCP has a way of checking the correctness. So maybe it has changed because of inference in the cable or so on. Things might get lost because the Wi-Fi connection was bad. Um, and this is all handled by TCP. So making sure that in the end you get something that is proper, 
the puzzle is essentially reassembled. Uh, there is an alternative to this, so just that you have heard it, there's something called the Uniform Data Protocol, UDP. Um, and it's, it's an alternative to TCP because if you read this, you can imagine that this is expensive. So it takes quite some uh, computing power, it takes time to actually make sure that things are correct, that the order is correct and so on. So instead people came up with a UDP protocol which is unreliable, so it doesn't care that much about order, correctness. If a package gets lost we don't care, we don't send it again. If things arrive in the wrong order we also don't care. Um, and the main reason to have that is that it's quicker. So in many cases, for example, if you're streaming video, live streaming, it's more important to be quick than to be correct. Uh, and then you can say, okay, I, I don't care if the video is a bit messed up in between, but at least it's going quick. Uh, so many times, for example, if you would use Skype, UDP is preferred because it's simply quicker. Okay. Um, so that was all we cover about how the internet works. It's pretty basic, but it gives you an understanding of what is happening. Uh, especially since I'll talk a lot about, for example, hosts, about the layers, I'll use the different uh, terminology. So you should be aware of that. Now we go from the internet to the World Wide Web. And we said that the World Wide Web is the information space. So it's all about documents, uh, pictures, videos, uh, items of interest. So something you would like to have. And to be formal, we typically talk about them as resources. So whether you want to have a website or a picture or a video, the terminology says, I want to have a resource. And these are identified in the internet using so-called uniform resource identifiers. So those are basically the addresses that say, I want to have the Wikipedia page on World Wide Web, for instance. Um, resource can be confusing. So if you don't really know what this means, uh, wait until we get to back end to the server side lectures, it will become clearer. For now, if we talk about a resource, you can think of a website, an image or a video, so that's fine. That's really what we want to do. Um, and to make this a bit clearer, we abstract from all these intermediate machines. We typically talk about the client server model. Uh, so my computer, I want to have google.com requests a resource and the server, the target host responds with the resource. Um, so instead of looking at the whole picture, we talk about the client server model. I want to have the Wikipedia page on World Wide Web. The Wikipedia server returns the right website. Or if something is wrong, it returns an error. Um, and as we have seen, uh, this is of course an abstraction. Usually there are a lot of different servers involved. Uh, there might, for example, be the web server, there might be a database server, there might be a mail server and so on. So it can be many machines, it can be different programs, uh, but to make this simpler, we talk usually about this client and server. Um, and that's it for the network part. So in the next part of this lecture, we look at HTTP, which is the protocol for the World Wide Web. So that's it for now.